So thank you all so much for your patience. Um, I apologize that we're getting off to a little bit of a late start today. Um, we've had a lot of moving pieces with this program and some last minute technical difficulties, but we are ready to go and it's going to be uh, an entertaining evening for all involved. Um, so thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Tate McCoffinoni, and I am the Curator of Collections and Acts Administrator here at the Matheson History Museum. And we are so excited to be partnering with the Aikman Jones Museum Cultural Center to bring this wonderful program to you all tonight. Um, here at the Madison History Museum, our mission is to preserve and interpret the history of Gainesville, Alaska County, and the surrounding regions. Um, so we are really excited to share this program um, that fits in with our mission and with the mission of the Aikman Jones Center. Um, just as a general reminder for those of you who are here today in person, um, we would like to keep ourselves and all of the people around us as safe as possible. So please do keep your mask fully over your mouth and nose at all times while you're in the building. And for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, uh, welcome as well. Uh, we will be uh, continuing to stream this live um, and then the recording will be available on the Madison's YouTube channel. And for those of you watching via Zoom, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the uh, comment box and I will share them as the time is appropriate. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to our host for this evening, Mr. Ken Simmons, who is a graduate of A.L. Levain High School, a graduate of Bethune Cookman University, and a past president of the Bethune Cookman University Alumni Chapter of Gainesville. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. First of all, good evening. Good evening. And I thank you for that introduction. I was asked by Mrs. Mom to preside over this. What is the function? I am very proud to be a graduate of HBCU University. Some people ask me to say, you had to do it over here when you go to Florida a &M. I said, no. <laughs> I'll do the same thing I did in the past. But I'm very proud to be a product of HBCU University. And all of my life, I've heard about Prop Jones. Prop Jones. Everybody, he must have I never met him. Person. He had to be a, as I was, excuse me, my friend, a hell of a man for going to be a president of, of the first, one of the first black uh, high schools to be accredited and all of that with the obstacles that he had before him. I heard tales that when he went to the school board meeting, he couldn't go inside the meeting. They had a little scoop or a tick. We had to get up on him and sort of stack it from my understanding. And he would have to peep through the window and hear from there what was going on in the school board meeting. So, as we have seen all of that kind of stuff, heard of those kinds of stories, every one of us who have been through the process, I went to a. O. Malay High School over the lot. We were the little country school. <laughs> you know, Lady thought they were what's what's going on. But but we all got a good education. Miss Parker was my librarian when I was in high school. And she could probably tell you some of the books we got probably wasn't seven days. It probably was four days. <laughs> but we all got a good education. It was a family when we were going to school. Everybody at the school could take care of it. Physically and mentally. I ain't gonna tell you about the physical, because they could get it. But at this time, it's just good to be here. We're gonna recognize uh, all of the HBCUs in the house. And that's what started with the first, and it would be, that's right, it's an applicant at all. 
That would be Bethune Cookman University, who many of you have known as Bethune Cookman College. I see I have a few of my in here. Sister Teasler and one wealthy. Very Calhoun, that's one. But we and then we got, I can see the rallies all over. Mr. the dudes and a few more that I see here. And, and we just got, we are the few of right, the fear is right. But we got Florida Memorial. We got Edwards University now. And Florida. Memorial University. I was going through all of us with colleges. And that's how things have, have grown and progress over the time. So now, and again, I'm the one who ended too. I'm going to have readings from our commissioner if she's here. Honorable. Walker, Desmond Walker, is she here? Okay, I can't do the greetings for it. Okay, so the first person they have here is Miss Richardson. Now I'll tell you about Miss Richardson is this below. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Carol Richardson and I'm the interim coordinator for the A. Quinn Jones Museum and Cultural Center. We want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with you and we want to thank the Matheson for inviting us. Why the A. Quinn Jones Museum? Mr. Simmons you know, gave you a little bit of background information on who A. Quinn Jones is. But what happened throughout the years is his legacy continues to remain by honoring him with this museum. So through the generosity of his family, the Jones family, they partnered with the City of Gainesville Community Reinvestment Agency to renovate the Jones homestead. So if you go on Northwest 7, there's a tiny little house that houses a exhibit honoring Dr. Jones. And what we want to do at the museum is preserve his legacy and the legacy of his family by keeping the African-American experience first and foremost in everyday life. As we know, our history is always rewritten and we want to be an institution where our history is not rewritten, but it's told truthfully and accurately. So the city of Gainesville has made a commitment through Wild Spaces Public Places to invest $300,000 in this home to make it a community and cultural center for you. So we have book talks that we're housing at the museum. We have music on the patio. We have lectures. We have, so please, Dr. David Canton in the future will be hosting classes there. We have a new partnership with the University of Florida Museum Studies to teach young people how to chronicle your history. If you don't want anyone else to tell it, you gotta learn how to tell your story. And we wanna be that place where you can come to learn to tell your story and preserve your story. So the museum is open to the public. It is taxpayers' dollars that are supporting it. We wanna thank the Jones family for their gener generosity in making this building available. We wanna thank the community from 2009 through 2017. It was very, a lot of people in the community that championed for this, that thought this was important. Mr. Golston, Stephanie C. Wright, the Jones family, Joe Buchanan. And as I am there, I want to always keep their legacy and the legacy of the Jones family alive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. I really didn't know myself what all was about the Aquin Jones Museum of the Seventh Avenue. I just think they put a little problem out there, and that was it. I didn't, but I do understand that we, if you got a history, you got to reserve it. And you know, if you read books, anybody who's a good writer can change anything. So you need to get it first time from people who have experienced it, who have been told the stories by their forefathers and mothers. So therefore, we thank you, Ms. Richardson, for all that you do over at the Aikman Jones Museum. 
And you know, we got about an hour and a half to be here, and I'm correct. So we're not going to use a lot of time. Talk. Loose type of like that. But this time, <laughs> we're going to ask that a good friend of mine <coughs> is here to speak. I knew his dad, his uncle, and everybody else around his family. So that is none other than Mr. John Dukes III. You may go. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm gonna, I, I haven't been nervous about doing any public speaking uh, ever since I did my first Easter speech mm -hmm. uh, years and years and years ago. So be honest with you, public speaking is definitely something that made me nervous. But I'm a little nervous this evening. And I'm a little nervous because, uh, one, I haven't been in a crowd like this one in a while. <laughs> Mask or unmasked. Um, so this is a little different for me because I've not had this experience, and of course I've never spoken through a mask. <laughs> and in fact, you know, growing up the way I grew up, you know, this mask probably would have gotten me killed <laughs> years ago. You know, and I'm that's different. That's different. You don't walk in the bank with a mask on, you're like, where's your mask? That's different. You know, it's it's kind of ironic that I find myself here talking about Aquin Jones and the influence of Aquin Jones in education. And HBCU, because to me, actually, it's personal, right? A very personal. Uh, so personal that, you know, I, I, when I sat down originally, I was going to, you know, do a little writing and kind of flesh this out. I've been asking, how long am I supposed to speak? You know, because when you go to a funeral, you know, well, you know they tell you, you know, if you're speaking on behalf of the family, whatever, you got three minutes. They're going to cook. And nobody told me how much time I had here, so I'm, you might regret it. <laughs> I'm not ready because I believe you know, that you know, I come from a family of educators. And I know that if you're going to get something across to a class, you probably need to get it in in about 15 minutes because everything after that is love <laughs> and good sleeping well. <laughs> Hopefully, I won't have to But I started out here as a young man who can tell you that Aquan Jones, I spent much time in his house. I went to Aquan Jones when it was Aquan Jones, not what they turned it into uh, since. Not that you don't have need of service, um, young people who need those services that they provide My son is actually a school psychologist there now. Uh, that's one of his schools. But the truth of the matter is, is that I'm the white sheep in the family because education was the family industry. Everybody that knew me said, well, you're John Fitz Jr.'s son, so oh, we know you're going to be a teacher one day and then a principal or something else. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so, oh, yes, you will. That's, you got it because you're John Fitz Jr.'s son. Well, John Beach Jr. exposed me to all sorts of people in all sorts of places. And he also exposed me to the idea that you become what you want to be and do that thing that will make you happy. Now, I was a young man, didn't know, didn't quite understand it fully to begin with, but as I matured, it came to me. But in my early formative years, I would tell you, they said that I was not a child who likes food. My father and my mother tell you, say, he's smart. He'll do well, but he doesn't like school. And they were right. I really didn't like school. 
My wife is a now retired special education uh, teacher and then staff and specialist. And I think she believes that I would probably be staff ADD or something because uh, <laughs> she, she spent a lot of time analyzing. <laughs> and I think that back then my problem would have been is that they didn't have staffing for me at school. Because I go to school and sit there, I was just bored after that. Because they were teaching me stuff I already knew. You could teach them. But at Aquin Jones, I had a third grade teacher. And to be honest with you, I don't even remember the names of most of the teachers I ever had. But I remember Miss Allen. <laughs> because Miss Allen used to bring extra books for me. And she would bring me books that didn't have a lot of pictures. And what I discovered was that she was giving me books that were basically like high school and some college books that she had from her education, <laughs> which dovetail real nicely with my family structure. Because you know how we always talk about the first in the family to go to college? <laughs> Buddy, <laughs> I can make no such claim. I can claim some first, we'll talk about that later, but I could have made the claim to be the first to go to college. But Miss Allen recognized that I needed more than what she was giving everybody else, and she did. So she would teach everything else, and she would give me an actual note with my own book. And while they were doing their lessons, I was doing mine. So I guess in a way, I was put in the gifted class, even though I was in the regular class, because there was no such thing as a gifted class. Everybody was in the same class at the time. And then I went to fourth grade at Acorn Jones, and then fifth grade happened. Fifth grade for me, 1966. Joel, Yvonne, those folks had already made their way to GHS. They were the big kids. So here it was, suddenly I'm finding myself, not the first day, but after the first week, walking past Aquin Jones, because we were just off of Fifth Avenue on Fourth Place, and we would walk to Aquin Jones, all of us in the neighborhood that went to Aquin Jones. And then here one day after we get ready to get going for our new school year, my dad came to us, he and my mom. And they said, we got something to talk to you all about. Now, whenever that happened, we started thinking about what have we done because there's about to be some leather thrown around. <laughs> or there's something serious that they want to tell us about. Well, they had something serious they want to tell us about. And that something was, that you're not going to be going to Eight Point Jones this year. Like, what do you mean you're not going to Eight Point Jones this year? I'll be ready to be a fifth grader, and then a sixth grader, and you know, um, I think they rebooted a little program they call the Wonder Years. And, and I remember when the Wonder Years came on, I couldn't quite identify with much of what they were doing. It was, you know, it was cute, but I couldn't really identify with that stuff, because that wasn't my life. Mm -hmm. And now they rebooted, and it looks like it's going to be a little bit more like, you know, maybe some of our lives. I didn't watch it because I think it started last night, but you know, the Wonder Years. Well, for me, that same time frame became the I Wonder Years. I wonder why the heck they are making me go somewhere else beside that window. Just as I'm about to be the, you know, one of the popular guys on campus, I might even try to a little girlfriend, I might pass that note and say, I love you, do you love me? Check <laughs> Just about that time. And all of a sudden, you know, they took us to J.J. Finley. This is a whole other story. J.J. Finley is no more, thank goodness. Because I was sent to a school named after a black racist. And here I was, the only black boy in the entire school, I found out once I got there. My sister was there, right behind me. Pam and Tony were there. 
Pat was there, her sister came the year. So essentially, I was it. Yeah, I won. But I did get a wonderful introduction to the speaking body of the school on my first day. Young man walked up to me and bumped into me. I'm walking down the hall. He bumped into me. Nice and heavy. And then when I look at him to see what was going on, I'm going to continue to walk. He's bouncing around in front of me like, uh, well, in my neighborhood, it was an invitation to a fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only difference was that he, he was actually offering invitation by saying, meet me at the corner after school. With all the other kids running around, you know, they yelling and screaming, coming, ooh, he's going to, I'm not going to name him. Gonna kick your. I mean, we didn't use those words over in our neighborhood because that was, you know, reason to die. But here was a whole class, you know, they're all cussing in the hallway, talking about what he's gonna do to me. So, first off, when, when you bump, when somebody bounced around in front of you like they thought they were getting ready to have a fight with Muhammad Ali or somebody, <laughs> talking about meet me at the corner. Well, first off, I was directionally challenged. <laughs> I didn't know where the corner was that you were talking about. <laughs> but I didn't get any directions on the front But what I did know was what my dad taught me, because y'all don't know it all. You know, I have people talk about my dad as their principal. Yeah, you thought he was some as your principal. You should have had that for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad, I found out down the line talking to people that went that were in the military with him and who went to school with him was that he was quite athletic. Including being a not just a fair weather boxer. And he used to tap with me literally four days a week. And when I say tap, I mean if you don't get your guard up like you taught you. This is not going to go well because it's going to hurt. We didn't have boxing with him. He was going to hit you with an open hand, but he might knock you out. So when this little cat started stepping up in front of me, bouncing around like he was Rocky Marciano or something, I'm going to get out here and beat him down. And that's what we did on our neighborhood. It was going to be a fight on the playground. It was going to be a fight on the playground. It was going to have to have two. I made two friends right away. Both of whom, it turns out, were bullied, I guess, by that dog. They became good friends, my own friends. See, I didn't have friends in fifth grade, sixth grade. <coughs> that little girlfriend thing couldn't happen. But even though I was no longer at Aquin Jones, I was going to Aquin Jones' house every Tuesday because. Mrs. Jones was my piano teacher. <laughs> and my dad and mother told me, you're going to take piano. I'm like, I don't want to take piano. <laughs> you go, no, you're going to take piano. <laughs> really? Yeah, you're going to take piano. They said, well, if you're going to play football one day, you're going to play piano. <laughs> and you're going to play it until you reach this age. And I tell you what, when I was that age, I quit. <laughs> I was pretty good at it, but I still quit. But Aikon Jones had so many influences in my life. My dad sat me down one day, and he was actually, we were talking inside, he was going to go outside the barbecue. Some of y'all might have had some of his barbecue. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm standing outside one day, he said, hey, how do you like how things are going? So, Dad, I'm not so sure. He said, well, boy, <clears throat> all I need for you to do is do your best wherever you are. You always make sure that you give more than you have to. And never let anybody be better than you because I'm going to tell you now, I'm good, you're good. And I don't want you to be ashamed of it. Don't ever be afraid to let anybody know how good you are. I live with that. 
Mr. Jones would come in and he'd look, see what you were doing. He'd look over your shoulder. He'd make sure you're respecting Mrs. Jones and whatever she was telling you, like she needed some help. <laughs> she had that ruler right next to her. She didn't need this help. <laughs> he was there. He was there. back up in. But those folks poured into me in a way that helped me to overcome all of my objections to being in the school at J.J. Finley. Because I had a teacher at J.J. Finley, and I remember her name too, and I remember it from that good thing, because she would ask questions in certain sections of the class. And you know how you raise your hand if you want to show that you know something? Man, I'd be sitting there, you know, I got pretty good biceps, probably from waving my arm in her class, and never get called. Thankfully, despite that experience, oh, by the way, her sending a note on saying that I needed to participate in class, which I thought was really rich. <laughs> After my dad beat me, because I wasn't participating in class, and that was an absolute no no, and I couldn't explain to my dad, that lady don't like me. That lady does not like me, she does not call on me. I am participating, no, no, boy. If you participate, no teacher does that. See, he was an educator first. He was an educator who believed that you looked out for children. Prof. Jones was that same kind of educator. He knew what was inside you. He was going to push you to bring it all in. And he was going to reward you with kind words and encouragement that despite the fact you did really good, do you think you could have done a little better? <laughs> That was the teamwork that they put on me. But this teacher sent a note home to my parents that I wasn't just, I didn't participate more in class. No, I didn't like that lady. And when Finley had, when JJ Finley had their celebration of many, many years, and they invited me to come back because they were hoping I would speak, I said, no, thank you. I won't be there. I asked my sister, she wanted to go. No, she's. I'm more traumatized than I was by that experience because there's, there's something about walking down the street and having uh, women coming out in their dusters and housecoats and telling the little niggas to go home. Where are you going? They were fine as long as moms and you know were bringing their children across to work in the houses over there baby, but they had a problem with the fact that we were actually going to school. This is 1966. Gainesville schools were not integrated. That happened at Gainesville High School didn't have anything to do with uh, full integration of Gainesville. Think to when they actually closed Lincoln. And when they finally started sending Lincoln students everywhere else in the world. Everywhere but them. My dad told me he stayed in Gainesville because of Acorn Jones. He had been offered jobs as a dean out in Arkansas. He was offered jobs hiring a veteran down in South Florida. And I asked him, I said, well, Dad, why do you stay here? He said, because they need me here. And Prof. Jones asked me to do all I could to carry on and do the things that Gainesville needed. And that's what I'm going to do. So he stayed. And I haven't really talked much about this, but this, that, this is kind of cut off for me. Because I've kept all most of this stuff, you know, kind of piled up inside for the longest time. Maybe have a place to lay this. But I understand now why I'm here today. I'm here today because Prop Jones's legacy is all inside of me. It guided my father and it kept him strong when things were going in a way. They should not have been. And for those of you who know his history, you know he became, he was the last principal of Lincoln. He was the first principal of Eastside. And he was the first assistant, black assistant superintendent of schools in Rochester County. And don't think that was easy. We used to get calls at our house. 
And you know, these weren't even how y'all doing talks. How things go? We so glad you where you are. You no, know, wasn't it? That's not what we got there. My dad always kept the little 22 pistol. <laughs> Everywhere he went, y'all didn't know that, did you? Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, uh, he walked not in fear. He didn't walk in fear because he always had his 22 with him. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you now, most people hear something like that. They say, what are you going to do? That's a pop gun. He came home with turkeys that he was going to give away. I said, yeah, I don't get turkeys. He said, oh, I want them. He want them where? He said, I want them at turkey shoot. I said, you want them at turkey shoot? Where? He said, well, they had a turkey shoot. You know, one of the rotary clubs or something. You know, they had a turkey shoot. I said, well, you want a rifle? He said, I don't need a rifle. They need, they need the rifle. <laughs> he, he was an expert in rifle. I ain't talking about one that said I'm an expert. No, I'm talking he's an actual expert in rifle. So he, he walked without fear. He saw Mr. Aikman Jones at least once a week. When he barbecued, Mr. Aikman Jones got barbecued before we did because the first barbecue that came off the grill, he was going to take it off and say, oh, I'm going to put this aside for Croft Jones. And he had a few other folks to say. Very special relationship. Rob Jones, over 100 years old when he passed. Still a sound mind, strong. And I tell you, if you think about all the folks who come his, you know, come past through him, who stayed here in Gainesville, who poured themselves into education of children here in this, in this county. They're all like this. They had one commitment and they all had HBCUs in their background. My family, as I told you, I'm not the first in my family. I have a picture in my pocket as <coughs> well that has my grandmother's uncle in a picture with Booker T. Washington. George Washington College at Tuskegee. Because he was an ADA camp in Brad. And he went and he taught at Tuskegee. My mother's father, right there in Hampton, taught at Florida A&M University. So I have no claim to fame when it comes to being first of the college. In fact, when I talk to people, you know, my dad was from Brandon, right over on the banks of the swan. As he said, he was baptized <laughs> on the banks of the swan. I'm not just talking about you saying that for, for emphasis. I'm saying he was actually baptized in the swan river in Brandon. And I met people who came later on, some of them who came to his funeral and after they said, you know something, your dad is special. I said, what do you mean? So your dad was the first person that we know that finished school from Brent. Finished school, finished high school, went off to college. So he's the first and only. He said, black or white, they don't know what? Well, they said color of white. They were from back in the day. But that says an awful lot about who he was. Says an awful lot about what people like Aiden Jones saw in others whose talents they wanted to advantage and groom for their communities. My journey to JJ family was not a pleasant experience. I look back on it and I think out of it, the only thing that really forged in me was a fire to never have anybody be able to point to a grade on the board and say theirs was better than mine. That's what school became to me. It wasn't even about the, yeah, it wasn't about the learning for the most part. And people say, well, you're a bug guy, you know, you're an exterminator, you're an entomologist, how they happen? I said, well, that happened in part because 
I decided I didn't really want to go to pharmacy school and complete pharmacy because I didn't see a pathway to being able to own my own pharmacy. In the long run, why do it if I'm not going to make you that? See, my grandmother in Tallahassee had a school. They had a flower nursery on the yard. You know, they, they, were right, they lived right down the street from Bamboo's campus. So it was about a two and a half, three minute walk. Actually, there was no minute walk if you walked across into the pasture that was in the long family. So for me, the idea of having to work for somebody else all of my days, my mouth was too quick. Sooner or later, somebody's going to fire me from a job I didn't want to be on anyway. And now I've been able to work for myself. So, you know, my boss loves the heck out of me. I got it. <laughs> you would be shocked how much my boss loves me. <laughs> I, I, I worry about it sometimes. You love me so much. But a, my J, a. Quinn Jones to JJ Finley to Westwood being again, I think I was one of the six at JJ Finley. I think everybody but me was from Lincoln Open. And those are the first black students that were at, at JJ at Westwood. Me, Noah from Noah, and a few other guys. Well, one other guy and a couple girls. But that was before official immigration. <laughs> Why is HBCUs important? Because they produce people like Prof. Jones, who poured in people like my dad, who poured into someone like me, and so many others that walk up to me and tell me how much he influenced their lives. Whether he taught them how to tie a tie, how to properly coordinate their dress, you know, all, all of those little things that we don't think much of, I guess, until it becomes important. First, you know, they have. I started out at Florida State University. I didn't even go to family first. But then Florida State offered me a, a really nice package financially uh, because they had this program that was designed for students like me, you know, those of us who were like in the top 5% of the SAT and PSAT scores in, in the nation. <laughs> you know, folks like, like us who really don't look like me back then because I was kind of by myself. I think that some of those folks, when they talked to me on the phone, they didn't realize who they were talking to. But again, the influences of the people that I had, like Nathan Jones and my dad and others, Dr. Walls and so many other men in, in, in Gainesville, brought me to a really wonderful place. It brought me to a place where I didn't worry about what somebody else thought. Doesn't matter what you think, I'm just gonna go in here and do what I do. And if you if you got a problem with that, that's your problem on mine. I transferred into Florida and then again I want to be a pharmacist because when I left GHS, my teacher said, you know, the counselor said, well, what are you gonna study when you go to college? And then I don't know. <laughs> I said something probably with science and math. She said, okay, well, look at this book. So I looked at this big magazine. And that magazine, this was a magazine during that time about this big. And then in this one page, there was this brother wearing a white lab coat. And I actually noticed this white lab coat after I noticed the 36,000 in big block that was under <laughs> for the dollar sign in front of me. Okay, I told him, I said, this is not going to do this. <laughs> And that's, you know, when I went there fishing in the PIMS program, all that science and chemistry and all that stuff I did was really to go to pharmacy school. Until I got in the pharmacy class and said, huh, I don't know about this. I might be counting pills for the rest of my life. A jacket. <laughs> and I went and I talked to Mr. Baker, who been in the has a Baker Pharmacy, which she right across from what is now the administration building, but used to be the hospital in Van Hill. And I said, Mr. Baker, what would you do if you and me? And I'm standing in this store. Man, tell me, look around. Tell me what you see. I look around and I told him what I saw. And by the time he got through telling me, look again and tell me what you see, I was naming potato chips and bubble gum. Mm -hmm. And he finally said, exactly. I did not open this to be a general scope. And when he said that, I know, once again, this man who's a product of an HBCU was pouring into me in a way that I could grasp, because he knew my family in Tallahassee. He knew that my grandmother had a general store that when we 
could find to go to Win Dixie or one of your, one of the bus stores and shop, you know, stop going to John General Merchandise. Because she would put your money on, you know, she just put money on the books. But if you had money, you would run them when Dixie and spent those whole things, they put money on the books. <laughs> but you got your paper. So he knew I didn't want to run a general store because he knew I, I knew all about it. One of the first pictures of me is me sitting on the counter in that store by the big cookie jar. And they taught me a lot. They taught me all the things I needed to know about what I didn't want to do and what I should not do. I ended up at Florida and with a professor who looked at me and said, hey, come on in. I had another professor who said, I, I took this class, I made it in the next term he came and he said, you're going to teach my lab next term. What's that? You can call Harvard. That, I bet that's not happening at the University of Florida. But they looked at me and they said, you can do this. So I taught two classes as an undergrad. That's my HBCU. The guy at FSU spent the first half of the year, first two quarters, not being in his office when it was time to advise him. He was always completely gone. Different experience. From FAMU, my HBCU, I went to Virginia Tech, and I asked to have someone who was under the same professor I had. And when he found me, he was looking for a black student specifically. That's what Dr. Peters told me. He said, he, Dr. Robinson met him at the Entomological Society of America meeting and asked if he had any students, and he found me. And we run each other not necessarily the right way all the way through the process because I didn't need as much help as he thought I was going to need. All I needed for him to do was just point me where he wanted me to go, tell me what he wanted me to get accomplished, and then get out of my way. It took me 20 years to get my research written up <laughs> with him when he called me and said, John, I want to do this with you. So we ended up with that one article that came out of my research. Thank you. With my HBCU, I came back to it. They invited me to be a member of the advisory council. And I've basically been a member since about 85 and a chair since about 87 or so. And oddly enough, I'm actually the, only the second black graduate of entomology at Florida University. Think about that. I'm the second. But I'm the first from Virginia Tech. I think there's been maybe one since then. So the HBCU experience, why is it important? Why are men like Aiken Jones important? Because without men like Aiken Jones, there's no John Hughes Jr. who came to Gainesville as a 13 or 14 year old to complete school from Brown. He worked, went to school. Um, Aquin Jones and, and folks like Aquin Jones are great. My new experience of being a first at Virginia Tech means literally nothing. I didn't intend to be first, but you also get a Fulbright fellowship. By the way, I earned a Fulbright because I had the qualifications for it. But Dean Roselle, I don't know if Dean Roselle was still there when you were there. Well, day one when I came, Dean Roselle met me, told me, there are some people who think you do not belong here. But you do. We do not hand out full bright fellowships to people who don't belong here. We have a long way to go. We have many experiences of people out here. I'm not bitter by any of it because honestly, uh, my journey was that has gone as it was intended. The good, the bad, the ugly, but at the end of the day, even the ugly looks pretty good to me because I used it to fuel me all along the way and to give me the point where I knew it was my responsibility that even though I didn't follow my family in the um, family business education, uh, my wife, you know, Contributing mightily. And uh, therefore, I think I have paid my penance. 
in not going in education. And I did spend literally up until about three years ago, at least three days a week in a school somewhere uh, as a mentor, working with young men and young women. I thank you all for paying attention to me. And I hope that I gave you something that's worth your time and your quality. Thank you. Most I've heard Mr. Duke talk since I've been known. I've been known for a long time. You know, I was just listening to that, Mr. Duke, and so many things he was saying, like not going in the book school. All of those that things that he's been on and on. And I, you know, my mother's an educator as well. She taught school before they allowed. She wasn't even, she didn't even have a college education. Uh, you know, back in the day, if you were supposed to be a so-called smart club person, you could teach the others. And she taught that in a school way out in Milwaukee called the Harlem School out in the black community. As a matter of fact, she taught my older brother. But you know, back in, in those days, the school was a family. And people took care of it. And Mr. Duke, some of those same things I had some experience. Simple. It just walked the thought. I, I, I didn't want to go to school, period. I have never fact stand today. Ms. Richardson has deceased father told me I thought I could play cards and shoot food and all that kind of stuff. But I was a little boy, I a teenager, used to go to a place called Manny Hogan Road in Alonzo after school and uh, try to do all that. And he walked in one day and said to me, You ain't nothing. But a son for those that play the game. They wait on you. And he said, You should never want to be a person. Because you ain't got the time to put in. This, this profession is just like going to school. <laughs> to be whatever you play. And that turned me around from doing that. And plus, in 19, about your time in 1967. When they were looking for all the black people they could to go to the military bureau to meet there, I went to Bethune for one semester. And I got home for Christmas. I had a letter from Miss Duncan, who was the lady that I did at that time, and had me come to the selective service. And she sent me to Jackson. And we go to Jackson the most of the time, people come back, heading on to Fort Bragg or whatever. Division of the military went. And I said to myself, I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a preacher. I heard they wasn't calling preachers into a military. <laughs> so I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> Thank God I didn't take that on my own because that would have failed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dukes, for your experiences. And there was another man, and when they have another one of these folks, they, they call me to talk about Carl, my baby. Amen. He was a, the principal at uh, Alaska County Training School. And until they opened, in the same year that they opened, closed Lank Lankin and opened East Side and all, and then they, we all got transferred into set. I think it's set. He did it, Prof. Jones uh, and, and Prof. Bain are the pioneers of education for the black community in this part of the town. Believe it or not, they were the men that spearheaded anything. And people asked me, Did you went to college? I said, Yeah, I did go. I finally did. But guess what? 
I had a lady that taught me ever since she birthed me in the world. She had a chart in the corner of the room. Yes. We had some work to say. Anyway. And she taught me when I got to first grade, I should have been probably in the third grade. So <laughs> she taught me every since I've been bigger than I taught. And that was a family deal. They started too early and they stood behind the teacher. They walked in the bus at the teacher. They stood behind the teacher. At this time, Miss Maker, is that a Manasa Maker regular? My boo. Yeah, come on. She has a lot of women. This is very difficult to call in <laughs> Excellency. <Do. laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here today also because of faith. Never met him, never experienced him, and it's very new. And I thank Carol Richardson, the coordinator for Quinn, for introducing me and bringing me into the Quinn family. And Saturday, we'll be able to share more at an event that we're doing here. Um, but it also links with the HBCUs because I, I gave birth to 10 children who have been educated at Badoon Cookman, the first one. <laughs> And the number nine and ten, Morehouse men. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very proud and, and happy about that decision that I made as a mother, that we made as a family, because although they were raised in a very Pan African home, understanding their roots and their connectivity to the continent and their role, therefore in the diaspora and specifically in the United States and even more specifically in the state of Florida, where we, we have lived. I've been based in Ethiopia for the last 16 years, but um, it was very important for them to have that HBCU experience in order to be prepared to continue the legacy, such as Quinn, such as Duke family. And, and so I'm very, very proud that they went along, although you know they don't have any choice. Like, <laughs> you know, um, and so I'm really, really thrilled that they not only got that education, but were able to hone great skills and great sense of self and purpose through the process. They have gained lifelong friends, more children, as if I needed more, right? Um, that have traveled to Africa with my children. As a matter of fact, my eldest daughter, Ayana, the first graduate of um, HBCU, um, Bertrand Cookman, actually started a program called The Exchange. And so she facilitated <laughs> visits for children, youth, um, high school students from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia and the diplomatic capital of Africa, to Atlanta. And so while many African students explored going to college in the United States, not many explored the HBCU option. And so for us, we thought this was a perfect fit. So my daughter was able to facilitate this program, which we ran for easily four or five years. We would take them to the U.S. Embassy first and sort of be deputized as little ambassadors coming to the United States. Um, and so it was a really rich experience. My family grad who marched in the hundred um, really did some exceptional work with me when I served as the manager here for the Bob Marley Foundation. We produced Bob Marley's birthday in Addis. Over 250,000 people were there and we brought the value choir to Addis about. And this was really really important and I'm gonna get to the future um, and I, I'm gonna go back a little bit more to the 1930s actually after this piece but what is very important right now is the link between Africa and the diaspora. We are the same people regardless of land and sea that may separate us. This is DNA. It's DNA. The trials, tribulations, aspirations that we have are very important. And again, I'll speak to a lot of this in my presentation on Saturday, so I don't want to give it away 
what we're going to be doing at, at Quinn. But the HBCU experience becomes <coughs> that thread that connects. Not many people know that the founding father, known as the father of Pan Africanism, Kwame Nkrumah, was a Lincoln graduate. Nambi Azikwe, the first president of Nigeria, was a Lincoln graduate. And there is a, a, a Zikwe in Kuma Hall to this day. It was built in 1895 before they graduated. I think they graduated 1939 for Nambi Azikwe and 1939 for Kwame and Kuma. Um, and it helped to shape the transformation of Africa to decolonize and take away the chains that Europeans had on the continent after the Berlin Conference. And someone goes into some history for you here. So the HBCUs, although we realize how important and they still are for liberating and giving opportunities to our young people here in the United States, clear across the ocean, on the continent, <laughs> there was equal transformation taking place. So these HBCUs are significant, were significant, and in the future will even be more significant when I get to that part of what I do currently in Ethiopia. But what is really important for me as a mother is to see my children that graduate from these HBCUs coming to Africa, whether they're in Ghana with me or Ethiopia, South Africa, whatever, and speaking to young Black continental <coughs> Africans that are in shock when they hear about this HBCU. What is it? Why was it? And now that there's desegregation so many years on, why do you maintain these Black institutions? And that dialogue, that discourse is very, very rich because it speaks to how do we maintain culture? How do we pass the legacy on? How do we, as Carol started saying, tell our stories? Well, this is done through the HBCU experience, notwithstanding the strong academic curriculum and, and so forth, that obviously that's why we send our children there. But the psyche, the environment in which we learn, I did my JD at the University of Florida, and it wasn't easy. And it was, it was just 20 years ago, and it wasn't easy. I remember when I graduated and they offered me the post after me, uh, Raheem Reed, as the acting director for the Center for Asian Race Relations. And then one of the person was hired in administration. And Automatically overnight, we had doubled the minority numbers in the elite law school administration. You know, so the HBCU quality is going beyond the boundaries as we know it, whether the state of Florida, whether the, the United States of America, and making major impact on the continent. When Kwame and Kuma speak spoke about his experiences at Lincoln and saw the caliber of African-Americans juxtaposed to the narratives that were told about each other, right? Because we have our own stereotypes that we even as Africans in the diaspora feel about continental Africans and vice versa. The HBC shatters all those stereotypes. It brings us together in this space where the best of the best and the brightest and, 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 and the richest come together. And I witness it every day as the liaison to the African Union in Addis Ababa on behalf of the Diaspora African Forum. So the Diaspora African Forum is the first and only <coughs> diplomatic entity on the continent that represents Africans in the diaspora to the continent, 55 countries. And our role is to build bridges, whether for education, employment, investment, um, social um, entrepreneurism, whatever it is, that's what we do. And being based in Ghana, again, we have students that we bring every year pre-COVID 
to the United States. Again, they have the HBCU experience, but they also have the general American experience. And now after 15 years running that program, some of these children have gone on to university, have gotten incredible scholarship opportunities, and are now enriching the lives of their families back home in Ghana. And so the future, the future for me of the African Union and the HBCUs is really important. And I'm seeing more and more institutions beginning to put together what they call the Model A. So maybe familiar with Model UN, but the Model AU, which they have empowered, and interestingly enough, at Colgate and non HBCU institutions, allow students to learn how the African Union operates. How does the African Union engage and what is its significance? This is what the future holds. The HBCU is a very important and vital group and we cannot underestimate yesterday, today, and tomorrow what the HBCU experience has. And I'm just thankful to Prof Quinn for interestingly enough being this thread again that brings me here born in Jamaica, educated in the United States, living and working in Africa for over 16 years, mom of 10 babies, like I said, with those mm -hmm. the family and more house to be standing here because of Prof Quinn. So I thank you all very much for giving me a few moments. You don't look like what you've been through. Right? <laughs> oh. That was very interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Now we have Yvette Carter, a graduate of Ed Waters University Tech. Um, before I left, I never did get to live in it, but 
I have a brief there. I have a stone there with my name on it, you know, for the students um, that came later. So, um, getting to Edward Waters, um, I was kind of sheltered. So, um, all I was thinking about was finishing high school, going to Santa Fe College, and having a summer job. Um, but my mother saw something a little bit deeper in me. And um, Friday nights was general conference night, so the choir would come and sing. And um, me and uh, myself and another friend and I, we got all excited when we announced that the choir was coming to our church. We were ready for it. We just, you know, we wanted to be there, we, you know, handmade out of suits. So we could, you know, just represent. And we got there Friday, that Friday night, and this Greyhound bus pulled up, and it was rocking, boy. I mean, they, they were getting down there rehearsing. So I was like, oh, let me come. Let's see this. Boy, they came marching off that bus like soldiers. I mean, we were like, wow, we was just on and off, you know? So at the end of the concert, you know, we meet and greet and everything. And uh, this was on a Friday night. Uh, so I spoke with the college president after speaking to my mom. I don't know what she told that man, but he asked me if I had a certain grade point average, if I could maintain it, and then I want to go to college. And I said, um, <laughs> yeah. So Monday morning, I was at Edward Waters College. Now, my, my idea of college was like looking at the University of Florida, and that's all the college campus. Edward Waters is very small. And I was, I was kind of like, you know, I was like, what, where, where, what, you know? But I didn't know what was behind the walls. Behind the walls, we had genuine care and concern from the teachers. The students were cohesive. They were together. They, they, they did everything together. It was a small campus. Everybody knew everybody. So what we did, um, we stuck together. We didn't have like a football team. We didn't have uh, really, I think we just had, uh, basketball. At that time, we just had basketball and tennis, and we had the choir. We had um, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, the only sorority on campus at that time. So, um, that's my heart. <laughs> uh, years later. But um, the life on campus, it was special. You know, we would attend chapel every Wednesday. Um, that's something I don't think big colleges or universities do. Um, historically black uh, colleges and universities don't um, do those things. So um, that was very interesting and it was humbling as well. Um, so I'm very proud, I'm very blessed, and I'm thankful um, that my mom saw something in me and I'm very, very, very humbled to gain the experience um, through my teachers from Aikman Jones. I left um, and went to fifth grade at Duval Elementary. And from Duval Elementary, I went to Howard Bishop. And Howard Bishop, things were changing um, for our students. And so it was a lot of chaos. It was, you know, um, we never been around like to have the National Guard to come on our campus, you know. So it, it put something in our heads. And it kind of woke us up to let us know where we were and what was going on. So um, today, I'm working um, with assisting other uh, incoming freshmen and students. Um, just as a, a, a small mentor, I just have like two or three that I'm working with right now. And to kind of share my experiences and let them know that um, just put your best foot forward to do the best that you can do. It doesn't matter where you are and let your light shine and you know, things, you'll be okay. So thank you all for listening to my little story. Okay. Early now. Miss, one of the latest talk of a teacher to me early in life. I was a little boy when you came along, Miss Griffin. <laughs> Can I get Miss Lily Griffin? Well, Jacob, I'm calling what I'm doing. Come on, Mr. Jacob. Come on, Mr. Jacob. Baltimore University. Baltimore, Baltimore. 
However, when I became a junior, we did the sit in, not by choice, 1960. Lord, the worst experience of my life. This man graduated from Florida A&M, praise the Lord, came there and said, we are going to sit, we're going to do a, a sit in, a march, civil rights march, movement. I didn't know what he was talking about, but he said, we've got to. So guess what he did? He took us, oh, by the way, his name was Dr. Robert Haley. Don't know if you all have heard of him. Robert E. Hill. I remember the E. And he took us to the Wood, F.W. Woodworth. And he did the city. No, I have heard. When I say the worst experience of my life, it was because on day <coughs> one, they beat some of the kids. Day two, same thing. <coughs> And here comes day three. And I wasn't going to go because my mom kept that phone hot. You better not get down there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you gotta go. So they said to me, Robinson, today is your day. <laughs> However, thank God to Johnson, who was president, called and put a stop to it. But it was a good experience. It was a bad experience. And I had some of my classmates to go to jail. The one thing I regret today, I would have had that record to show you. <laughs> brag about it. But anyway, going to a black school was the best thing that ever happened to me. We were first class citizens. When you go to these elementary schools, you were not first class. Oh, you may be the first African American that graduated. No, all of us that attended these black institutions were first class citizens. Am I right? You had a wonderful time. And I still support my college. It's now in St. Augustine and it's now a university. But when I was in college at St. Augustine, I'm sorry, it was a college, but now it's a university located in my town. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he says, that's my story, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rivers. And you know, as you hear, as you hear everybody talk, especially about the HBCUs, they can hear a, kind of like a, a similar story all the way through, don't you? Yeah. The HBC experience. Ain't nothing like, there is nothing like it. And I went to the University of Florida, got my master's degree from Rollins College in New York. But I will never forget what I was at at Bethune Cook University. And like I heard one person say, I passed. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't no Many people don't know. I got a my mom had to come to the pool a lot. <laughs> my mother's also a graduate. She was a graduate of Bethune Cookman University. Bethune Cook. She worked, she was one of Mrs. Bethune, uh, I guess you say house ladies. She was there in 1956 when she passed. But my mom, thank God for her. I should have never finished the college. Never. <laughs> Here he is. I was better. I'll take a dare and a heart. You tell me, don't do it. I'm going to do different. You told me not to. I, I don't know where I got it from, but I, I'm just jealous. <laughs> and you know, one thing about it. You know, if you talk about the Greek community, I think that say something about the Greeks. The Zaylami, they say, I'm going to sing. But I've never played anything while I was going to HBCU. <laughs> Back in the day, that wasn't a good thing. In my opinion, it's a dude. 
just uh, do what you know about it. You, you, did you play in that family? Well, you might not, you might have a real life. See, back, back in the 70s and 60s, playing in these street stuff, this stuff you hear about at the University of Florida. Nah, you don't get in there. I walked through there, I walked through there to stay in the street. It was a music, all those different things that went on in the HBCU, the bands, the football game. This is different than a football game than the HBCU. That is the universal sport. And you know what? When these big universities want to play a little old FC or whatever they call it, the smaller schools and they bring their game. That's the only time you see all of them stay in the stand. But they know they get to the see a spectacular show. And I just love, I mean, I've been the marching men for cook. Not the marching, not the pride. I was in, and I, my band director was from Fort A.M. University, not the Bears. He, really, he, he changed the band atmosphere at the Cook University. Everybody in the world knew of, of the Martin 100. And he said, we're going to come close to the Martin 100 and get past it. And I think if you go on record today, I'll say the Martin, the, the pride of the Thule Cook University takes no backseat to no band in this country. We had a, it's a family, everything was family, this. Cohesiveness there. And that's what it's all about. And I, I appreciate all the speakers who have spoken tonight. It just, I, as, as I used to hear President Moore, it made my heart burn. And that's what it is. You, you get a lot of knowledge, and it was great. So, Mr., I guess the, when I came back today, but this fellow, I'm telling you, used to come up here. He was, he was supposed to be one of the top. DJs, and I see his, I see his buddy back there. Maybe his buddy back there too. They were the, they were the top DJs in town. The top DJs. They were the top boys right in the beach when I was running the surf myself. <laughs> and one I looked, I said, uh, I think I saw uh, the Honorable Roger J. Long passing out some paraphernalia of him running again. Let us, I can't tell you who to vote for, but I think he's a good man. Sir Ray Henry. Huh? Sir Ray Henry. Sir Ray Henry here too? Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I was, I didn't see you, Sir Ray. You must have been here today. Oh, uh, he's here. That's, you know, you know, you know other of our potential, our past, here, of course, our politicians. Yes, sir. I don't know your name, so. Oh, I'm Tom Wells, the director of the U.S. Congress. Oh, yeah, I've seen your name, but I never knew. Good to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Now, I'm going to let Mr. Fee, Wayne Fee, my friend. But the game's your rise. <laughs> you know what that is? You know, and, uh, all of us have done some work with our young people. And he's one. So, Mr. Fields, thank you guys. Thank you. I'm not going to get up and say anything else. Thank you, Ms. Norman and Ms. Richardson, for inviting me. I hope I did a good job for you all. And I'm going to say it. Take care of this thing. Come on. Okay, I'm going to set the tone here. Most of what you've heard, a little bass in this, take out the little highs and the mids. And try and do this in a different format. You all have heard everyone give a lecture. You have heard about the history that they all possess. And they've spoken to you about 
historically black colleges, universities. Unfortunately, I did not get an opportunity to go to a historically black college. My kids did. My mom and dad as well did. If you can put up the first slide of a picture that I'm going to show you. Ms. Robinson, Liz Jenkins, excuse me, spoke about my father. His name was Dr. Julius Fields from St. Augustine. He graduated from the Harry Medical School, Nashville, Tennessee. And he taught also at Florida Memorial. And he met a young lady by the name of Geraldine Farrar Youngblood. And then they created Wah. <laughs> my father was the only child. My mother was the only child. And I was the only child. That is my first son. And we're going to try and create something close to his era while I'm talking to you. And we're going to do what's called but we're going to do what's called father shot talk. And I'm going to talk to some people and they're going to come. And Earl, if you can move just a little faster and get my head done. And I'm going to try and come close to my son's look who went to Florida a &M University. After Florida a &M University, he attended Morehouse College. And my second child, he went to East Tennessee State University on an athletic scholarship. And my daughter went to Bethune-Cookman College. And then it shortly turned into Bethune-Cookman University. She was a member of the 14 karat gold dancer. And she could go and still can go. So, my life, if I can get this mic stand right here. Here we go. My life started in 1954 to Dr. Julius Fields and Geraldine Miller, as most of you all know. My father worked so hard. He worked and he really put in a lot of hours. He died at the age of 46 and he had a massive heart attack. And from that massive heart attack, I was 13. Every single growing from Jim C. Miller. Jerry C. Miller was at Lincoln High School from the first day that it opened in East Gainesville, just off Wall Road. It's Lincoln Middle School. And we were Lincoln, which is where we live now. Built by Tommy Richard for five thousand dollars. Today it's valued at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And I tell you that not only did he build that home, but he built Lake Estates and the other homes up and down the Eleventh Avenue. And I attended Williams Elementary, and my parents told me that. We would like for you to be prepared to go to a 
middle school, or I was a junior high school then, in order to get accustomed and used to being involved in integration. They were basically telling me that you need to prepare yourself by attending a school where there are white students as well. And that attendance every single day was an adventure. It was an experience. And that experience was answering any type of questions. Why is your nose so loud? Why are your lips so thin? Does your hair is so coarse? But this is the one thing that did happen. Sports made the difference. Football, basketball, track, swimming, golf. And the only reason I knew how to play all of those sports was because of Mr. Andrew Mickle in swimming, Mr. Bobby Air in tennis, Mr. Joe Hightower in track, Mr. Joe Hendricks in golf, all different sports that I learned. When I arrived at the University of Florida, the University of Florida said, oh, I did go to Florida on a football scholarship. And when I arrived there, they called me one of the top athletes that they'd ever seen. And that was completely because I learned how to play all those sports. My mom and dad were teachers at Lincoln High School. And when we moved to Lincoln area, 1963, there was an assassination. And I remember my teachers wanted to make sure that I knew who died. Does anybody remember? John Kennedy. Correct. And so during those times, if you will hand me that album, we participated in a musical that my mom and dad put together. It was called Bye Bye Herbie. And there's a young man who played on this album, and his name is Wayne Fields. I had an opportunity because I was the son of two music teachers to learn how to read music as well as how to play instruments. They were allowing me to play a band instrument. They taught me how to play string instruments, the viola, the cello, and the bass, violin. I played in the Gainesville String Orchestra for 12 years and actually had an opportunity to move on. A young man who also played on this album is here tonight, and I'd like to hope if you would to come up. If you can go to that stand over there, Mr. Sherman Henry, if you please would come up and tell your experience on what it was like going to Lincoln High School and the influence that Jerry Miller and Geraldine Miller had on your life. Mr. Sherwin Henry is Earl Young, the barber's cousin, and he's former commissioner, a graduate of Lincoln High School, as well as a candidate for the vacated seat by Gail Johnson, it is City Commission at large seat. Seat B. Let's give him a round of applause as he explains. Two minutes if you will, sir. How can you explain Lincoln High in two minutes without trying? <laughs> anyway, let's talk about Bye Bye Birdie first. Let's start there. Um, Bye Bye Birdie was the first musical that was produced in Lincoln High School. And that experience was so eye-opening uh, to those of us who were musicians. And let me just give you a, uh, share a funny story with you. As Mr. and Mrs. Miller were planning by my birdie, they had a dilemma in that as I came to school, uh, Mr. Miller 
uh, came to me, said, uh, Henry boy, uh, my wife and I had a deep discussion about you. So I'm wondering, uh, okay, what did I do? He said, you know, my wife wanted to do the same with the uh, chorus uh, by my verdict. And I told her that I also needed a drum. Because at the time, I was the only student at the school that actually had a drum set. So Mr. Bella told me that he uh, reasoned with Mrs. Bella and he went out and I was able to play the drums uh, for my library. The other thing was, too, we had an intern from the University of Florida, and his last name was Powell. And uh, what he contributed to this was, was just magnificent. His forte was a French horn, and our orchestra wasn't that large, but as a musician, those of you who are might appreciate this, as he added that French horn to our orchestra, that French horn made our orchestra sound uh, go from like uh, 15 to 20 pieces to like 30 or 35 pieces. Just, that's just how rich the sound was. But getting back to the personalities of Mr. and Mrs. Miller, Mr. Miller was the culture one. And Mr. Miller was the father figure. Uh, Mrs. Miller, in her teaching, she informed us that it wasn't all about singing, but it was about posture, it was about breathing, it was about diction, it was about intonation. All of that went into singing. And so she wanted to make sure that as we presented ourselves as a chorus, not only will people hear great music, but they will also leave with the image of a very well-taught, well-trained chorus as well. Now, on the other hand, Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller was about teaching us about life. Every other Friday, we would not have bad practice. And Mr. Miller would sit and he would talk to us about life issues. As a matter of fact, Mr. Miller was the first teacher that actually warned us of the impending desegregation of not only Lincoln High, but the black schools in the county. And, you know, being young, being in 11th grade, you, you hear it, but you really didn't quite grasp what he was sharing with us. Because one thing that he did share was that at the time he was actually in school working on his master's in mathematics because he was preparing for the future. And he shared this with us. He said, I want you all to understand that when this school closes, a lot of the teachers that you love that are here they're not going to be able to go to the other schools to teach. So what I'm telling you is that you need to prepare for what is coming. And that is what makes Lincoln so special because our teachers taught us with the attitude that as we leave Lincoln, that we were going to have the tools to be prepared to deal with the real world. And when Lincoln closed, we really understood what the real world was all about. Because I was a senior at the time, and Lincoln High closed in the middle of my senior year. And that really hurt. And it really threw a lot of us off on our path to where we were going. But because we had been prepared, that we were able to recover and overcome that obstacle. So those are just a few things I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Now, after I finished high school, I went on to the University of Florida. And that opportunity to go to Florida and play football and get an education and get drafted to go to the NFL was an opportunity that was once in a lifetime. 
I fought. But the real once in a lifetime opportunity was the opportunity to start a business with two gentlemen who were sitting back there on the couch, Rodney Long and Bill Feinberg. We started a group called Music Express. And Music Express was about music. That's why we called it that. And our logo, our, lo our slogan was a choo choo train. Our logo talked about travel, moving, the music. And what started as just some street DJs. Right, come on up for a second. Come on. What we were able to do is start activities and events that was motivated by my mom, Bill's mom, Rodney's mom, my dad, Bill's dad. And they would always come together and give us opinions of what we were doing and how we were running the business. Two African Americans and a Jewish guy back there who was absolutely a genius. For 10 years, we did WOMD, Music Express, Music World Record Store. We did Project Heatwave. We did the All American Sport of Thumb. We did the Martin Luther King Commemorative Celebration. And we started a petition to have representation from a specific part of Gainesville. And it was called District One. And Rodney Long was the first elected official in District 1. Right. University 
with the local Mormon state. But there was a movement going on at the University of Florida. And it was headed by a gentleman by the name of Coach Doug Dick. But we called him Abraham Dick because he was the first to recruit players that were African American to the SEC, contrary to Holloway at Tennessee and other players. And then when he came to the University of Florida, he told his coaching staff to reach out and get the best African American players in the state. And how could I turn that down? Guys like that boy who went on and played 13 years in the NFL with Miami Dolphins, Jimmy Dubos, who was the first round draft choice and an All American, Sammy Green, who was an All American also, who went to Seattle, and on and on and on. We formed a bond and we also started a union called the Union of Black Athletes. And what we would do was help each other. We tutored, we did homework, helping each other, and we ended up graduating and getting out of the We were led by two individuals. If you go to the University of Florida, Big Hill Griffin Stadium, you will see a room in gate two. It's dedicated to the legacy of Willie Jackson and Willie George. Those two came in together as the first two African Americans to attend and play football at the University of Florida, and they were the first two to graduate. So they did an outstanding job of leading us when we played and went to Tuscaloosa, Alabama against Bear Bryant. We had 35, 35 African Americans on the team. The next game after that was Ole Miss when we went to Mississippi, and we had 35 gentlemen who were African American on this team. And when I tell you, we thought that I leave. <laughs> what we heard that day was alarming, but it was motivating because they scheduled us during their, they scheduled us for their homecoming. And they called us everything but the child of God. But on that day, we beat them 16 to nothing. And it was a rally for us to come together as a team. But here was the one thing that we all loved. We all pledged. Many of us pledged in fraternities. And I pledged Captain Alpha Psi. And there's a young man who's here who is the president of the alumni chapter for Captain Alpha Psi as well as a graduate of Florida a &M University, Mr. Bobby Johnson. And I will tell you what it really like, the impact that historically black colleges had on this city, as well as the impact that it had on him. First of all, thank you, uh, one small correction. That's President of Cap Episode, President of Florida, and a local alumni chapter in Rockland County. So, um, what HBCU, what family led to me, what family still leads to me is this. As it was said, it stated earlier, attending an HBCU is an un, unreal experience, an experience you have to go through it yourself to understand what it is about attending an HBCU that just separates itself from a particular educational institution. I went to family, my pops attended family, I'm a family graduate, I have a daughter that's a family graduate. I have extended family members of the family graduates, so it's in our blood. What family did for me was give me a sense of pride, being able to walk around campus, to be amongst those that look like you, talk like you, have some same commonalities as you, have a connection with your professors that care about you, that made you pay. You need to tighten up, you're not here to play, you make sure you get your education. But more important, make sure you make a difference once you leave family. 
And that's what FAMU is still in me as an HBCU, and along with a lot of other graduates from FAMU that has impacted not only the local community here in Gainesville, but nation, national and national level as well. I mean, we've had some dynamic graduates from FAMU historically, Althea Gibbs, the first African-American woman to win Wilbur. We had Willie Bob Hayes, an Olympic gold medalist. You want to list those long? We have filmmakers, Rob Hardy, along with William Packer, that have made such movies as Girls Trip, Obsessed, along with now we're in the next movie, let's say The Next Man, the Lone Steve Hardy, those individuals that had Kevin Hardy as well. But more importantly, not just the graduates of family that has left a mark of impact on this nation is this. It's HBCU is a family, a family that's across this whole nation that we bond together and we have some commonalities that we also still, some struggles that we still have together. But more importantly, we understand what it takes and what it means to be an HBCU graduate. If you look back, and just realize the impact that HBCU graduates have. Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, current mayor of Atlanta, along with Stacey Abrams, played an integral part in this recent election to make sure that Georgia turned from red to blue. And that was a decided factor in this election. HBCU graduates. So, something that I stated with pride, I will say today. And I say it tomorrow and wherever I take my last breath on this earth, family today, family tomorrow, and family forever. Thank you, my love. Right. Thank you, Lou. We have one more thing to present to you, but we're going to let him get on the turntable, if you will. You're going to just wave at us and say goodnight. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, would Carol, Carol, would you please come up? And also the director of the Nakasa Museum. I would like to present you two both with an album by my bird. This is the sixty-nine, and it still has the original shrink wrap on. So, please give me a Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. DJ Franco over here on the turntable. Thank you so much, Francois. My lovely wife, another table. Hey, how's it look? Is it good?